There seems, however, to be a problem with some of our most cherished beliefs about the world. They are leading us, inexorably, to kill one another. A glance at history, or at the pages of any newspaper, reveals that ideas which divide one group of human beings from another, only to unite them in slaughter, generally have their roots in religion. It seems that if our species ever eradicates itself through war, it will not be because it was written in the stars, but because it was written in our books. Our situation is this. Most of the people in this world believe that the creator of the universe has written a book. We have the misfortune of having many such books on hand, each making an exclusive claim as to its infallibility. People tend to organize themselves into factions according to which of these incompatible claims they accept. The central tenet of every religious tradition is that all others are mere repositories of error, or at best, dangerously incomplete. Intolerance is thus intrinsic to every creed. But technology has a way of creating fresh moral imperatives. Our technical advances in the art of war have finally rendered our religious differences, and hence our religious beliefs, antithetical to our survival. Words like God and Allah must go the way of Apollo and Baal, or they will unmake our world. A few minutes spent wandering the graveyard of bad ideas suggests that such conceptual revolutions are possible. Consider the case of alchemy. It fascinated human beings for over a thousand years, and yet anyone who seriously claims to be a practicing alchemist today will have disqualified himself for most positions of responsibility in our society. Faith-based religion must suffer the same slide into obsolescence. What is the alternative to religion as we know it? As it turns out, this is the wrong question to ask. Chemistry was not an alternative to alchemy. It was a wholesale exchange of ignorance at its most rococo for genuine knowledge. We will find that, as with alchemy, to speak of alternatives to religious faith is to miss the point. Many religious moderates have taken the apparent high road of pluralism, asserting the equal validity of all faiths. But in doing so, they neglect to notice the irredeemably sectarian truth claims of each. As long as a Christian believes that only his baptized brethren will be saved on the day of judgment, he cannot possibly respect the beliefs of others, for he knows that the flames of hell have been stoked by these very ideas, and await their adherence even now. Muslims and Jews generally take the same arrogant view of their own enterprises, and have spent millennia passionately reiterating the errors of other faiths. It should go without saying that these rival belief systems are all equally uncontaminated by evidence. There is clearly a sacred dimension to our existence, and coming to terms with it could well be the highest purpose of human life. But we will find that it requires no faith in untestable propositions. Jesus was born of a virgin, the Quran is the word of God, for us to do this. The Myth of Moderation in Religion The idea that any one of our religions represents the infallible word of the one true God requires an encyclopedic ignorance of history, mythology, and art even to be entertained, as the beliefs, rituals, and iconography of each of our religions attest to centuries of cross-pollination among them. Whatever their imagined source, the doctrines of modern religions are no more tenable than those which, for lack of adherence, were cast upon the scrap heap of mythology millennia ago, for there is no more evidence to justify a belief in the literal existence of Yahweh and Satan than there was to keep Zeus perched upon his mountain throne, or Poseidon churning the seas. According to Gallup, 35% of Americans believe that the Bible is the literal and inerrant word of the creator of the universe. Another 48% believe that it is the inspired word of the same, still inerrant, though certain of its passages must be interpreted symbolically before their truth can be brought to light. Only 17% of us remain to doubt that a personal God in his infinite wisdom is likely to have authored this text, or, for that matter, to have created the earth with its 250,000 species of beetles. Some 46% of Americans take a literalist view of creation. 40% believe that God has guided creation over the course of millions of years. This means that 120 million of us place the Big Bang 2,500 years after the Babylonians and Sumerians learned to brew beer. If our polls are to be trusted, Nearly 230 million Americans believe that a book showing neither unity of style nor internal consistency 
was authored by an omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent deity. A survey of Hindus, Muslims, and Jews around the world would surely yield similar results, revealing that we as a species have grown almost perfectly intoxicated by our myths. How is it that, in this one area of our lives, we have convinced ourselves that our beliefs about the world can float entirely free of reason and evidence? The doors leading out of scriptural literalism do not open from the inside. The moderation we see among non-fundamentalists is not some sign that faith itself has evolved. It is rather the product of many hammer blows of modernity that have exposed certain tenets of faith to doubt. Not the least among these developments has been the emergence of our tendency to value evidence and to be convinced by a proposition to the degree that there is evidence for it. Even most fundamentalists live by the lights of reason in this regard. It is just that their minds seem to have been partitioned to accommodate the profligate truth claims of their faith. Tell a devout Christian that his wife is cheating on him, or that frozen yogurt can make a man invisible, and he is likely to require as much evidence as anyone else, and to be persuaded only to the extent that you give it. Tell him that the book he keeps by his bed was written by an invisible deity who will punish him with fire for eternity if he fails to accept its every incredible claim about the universe, and he seems to require no evidence whatsoever. Religious moderation springs from the fact that even the least educated person among us simply knows more about certain matters than anyone did 2,000 years ago, and much of this knowledge is incompatible with Scripture. Having heard something about the medical discoveries of the last hundred years, most of us no longer equate disease processes with sin or demonic possession. Having learned about the known distances between objects in our universe, most of us, about half of us actually, find the idea that the whole works was created 6,000 years ago, with light from distant stars already in transit toward the earth, impossible to take seriously. Such concessions to modernity do not in the least suggest that faith is compatible with reason, or that our religious traditions are in principle open to new learning. It is just that the utility of ignoring or reinterpreting certain articles of faith is now overwhelming. Anyone being flown to a distant city for heart bypass surgery has conceded, tacitly at least, that we have learned a few things about physics, geography, engineering, and medicine since the time of Moses. These are ultimately questions for a mature science of the mind. If we ever develop such a science, most of our religious texts will be no more useful to mystics than they now are to astronomers. From the perspective of those seeking to live by the letter of the texts, the religious moderate is nothing more than a failed fundamentalist. He is, in all likelihood, going to wind up in hell with the rest of the unbelievers. By failing to live by the letter of the texts, while tolerating the irrationality of those who do, religious moderates betray faith and reason equally. Unless the core dogmas of faith are called into question, that is, that we know there is a God, and that we know what He wants from us, religious moderation will do nothing to lead us out of the wilderness. Imagine that we could revive a well educated Christian of the 14th century. The man would prove to be a total ignoramus, except on matters of faith. His beliefs about geography, astronomy, and medicine would embarrass even a child, but he would know more or less everything there is to know about God. His religious ideas would still be beyond reproach. There are two explanations for this. Either we perfected our religious understanding of the world a millennium ago, while our knowledge on all other fronts was still hopelessly inchoate, or religion, being the mere maintenance of dogma, is one area of discourse that does not admit of progress. We will see that there is much to recommend the latter view. If religion addresses a genuine sphere of understanding and human necessity, then it should be susceptible to progress. Its doctrines should become more useful rather than less. Progress in religion, as in other fields, would have to be a matter of present inquiry, not the mere reiteration of past doctrine. Whatever is true now should be discoverable now and describable in terms that are not an outright affront to the rest of what we know about the world. By this measure, the entire project of religion seems perfectly backward. It cannot survive the changes that have come over us, culturally, technologically, and even ethically. Otherwise, there are few reasons to believe that we will survive it. Moderates do not want to kill anyone in the name of God, but they want us to keep using the word God as though we knew what we were talking about, to say, for instance, that the Bible and the Quran both contain mountains of life-destroying gibberish, is antithetical to tolerance as moderates currently conceive it. 
And so it is that every human being comes to desire genuine knowledge about the world.